May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice. Selah. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation and in the name of Of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, May the the king, may the king answer us when we call. God, we thank you for your word tonight. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would would speak these blessings over our lives as we begin this new year. God, may these words in your word in Psalm 20, God, may they not only be spoken over our lives tonight, but God, may they uh, prophetically be spoken over our lives throughout this year, that God, in a way, in a sense, these words would guide us and keep us and uphold us and strengthen us. We're thankful that though we can't predict what's going to happen this year, you know. You know every single detail, and we're at peace with that because you're a a good, good Father, and we trust your love for us. Tonight, we ask that you would encourage us and strengthen us, God, that your word would be spoken over us in a way that would give us life and cause us to flourish spiritually. I pray tonight, God, that um, you would be recalibrating us, uh, God, making adjustments in our lives so that uh, our path is straighter, our Commitment is more determined. God, our faith is uh, more focused on you than it ever has been before. Cause, we pray your blessings to flow in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is obviously a psalm of David as um, David, you know, conveys himself as the author. And then, of course, he's writing the, in this particular circumstance. There were times where David wrote not only the lyrics, but he also wrote the melody and then he composed it on the Niganoth or whatever instrument he happened to be playing. He was a really talented guy. Um, in this particular circumstance, David is composing the lyrics, but he's passing it off to the chief musician, chief musician who would have been one of the priests. There was um, a particular group within the Levitical priesthood that really they were dedicated to worship in the temple, or in this case, the tabernacle, because the temple hadn't been built yet. Um, So David is composing these words, and he's passing them off to the one who's really going to put it to music. Now, um, this particular translation says a psalm of David. There are other translations that say a psalm for David. Um, So it's possible that David is writing a psalm uh, in a way for himself, almost in a sense that as this psalm is read and spoken, it is done so as a prayer over the king. Um, which I think is absolutely appropriate. You know, we in our life should never be above getting prayer. We should never be in a place. And there are people who come to me and they say something almost apologetically, Pastor, can I pray for you? Like, like, uh, you know, you're the pastor and you probably really don't need it, but if it's okay and I'm almost sorry for asking, can I pray for you? And I'm like, no, get away from me. No, I don't say that. (laughs) Who are you, you little person? Uh, obviously not. It's like, yes, please pray now and just don't pray now. Pray always. I covet your prayers. I need your prayers. Uh, We should never be in a place where we're above. Sometimes this happens in ministry. You know, when you're the one counseling and when you're the one praying for people and when you're the one teaching the word and telling everybody else how they ought to live their life, you know what I'm talking about? Well, let me just tell you how it is. Um, (laughs) Sometimes, listen, sometimes, and, uh, and I know this, I've been in ministry long enough to be able to say this, 
Sometimes uh, you're the last one who's actually open to receiving encouragement or receiving correction or being humble enough to receive prayer. It's a very dangerous place to be, particularly for people who have a counseling ministry, who find themselves in a place where they're counseling everybody else. And um, oftentimes what unfortunately I see is those people can begin to think that they're the last one. Since they're the fount of all wisdom, Of course, they know that everything that they're doing is right, and that's not always the case. So my point is this. We need to be humble. It's good to ask people for prayer, and um, please don't ever feel like you're above that. Uh, Tonight, I chose this psalm because this psalm has six blessings in it. There are six blessings in this psalm, and I really wanted to begin this year, if nothing else happens tonight, I wanted to begin this year by speaking these six blessings over your life, um, and that these blessings from the Word of God um, would, it would really be a blessing to you. So when I say blessing, I mean this. Um, these things that we're going to be speaking, they kind of operate as, as prayers. In a way, as I am teaching them to you, I'm asking in prayer that God would do these things in your life. Um, but even more than that... Um, Since it's from the Word of God, I am praying knowing, without a shadow of a doubt, as I ask God to do do these things, as these things come from the Scripture, I know for sure that God is going to do them. Um, I think it's um, important for us to be able to uh, look at these blessings and kind of use them in a sense to navigate and guide our year. My prayer tonight is that these things are like seeds that get planted in your heart that God will bring forth to remembrance as you go throughout your year. Um, tonight, I'm going to speak. There's, uh, I have half of the responsibility, and you have half the responsibility. I'm going to speak these things over your life. Sorry, going through puberty. I'm going to speak these things over your life. <laughs> Waiting for hair to grow. I'm going to speak these things over your life. Okay, I'm going to do the speaking. You have to do the receiving. I'm going to do the speaking. You have to do the receiving. This is how it works. When someone comes to me and uh, they're like, hey, pastor, uh, can I pray for you? Yeah, Uh, yeah, absolutely, you can pray. And while they're praying for me, God, I pray that you would have your hand on pastor's life. I'll say out loud, I receive that. I receive that in Jesus' name. By the way, that's not Pentecostal. That's just smart. (laughs) When someone is speaking something over your life that's biblical, your part in the process is to receive it, to acknowledge it, to say yes to God. Uh, So as these things are spoken over your life, your part tonight is to take it and embrace it, not just as information, but as, in fact, what God is going to do in your life in 2017. So six very simple blessings tonight. The first one, obviously, uh, is in verse one, but um, you can identify these six blessings later on. You can do a a more in-depth study but each of them are identified by the, by the word may. And the word may is simply a request to God. So number one, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. Uh, may you have this year the blessing of God's help. May you have this year. Do you receive that? So look, I'm going to do this. This is how it's going to work tonight. As we go through each of these, uh, when, when I say may you have the blessing of God's help this year, at that point, you're going to say this. I receive that. Look, you can even get crazy and you can say, I receive that in Jesus' name. Some of you are Pentecostal, right? And you're like, uh, don't like, like burst out in tongues or anything like that. Um, we can do that later, but we need the gift of interpretation uh, because all the gifts are for today, but not right here in this moment. So, so look, it's, it's been a long weekend. Um, may the blessing of God's help be with you in 2017 awesome kind of works like this when you're in trouble this is what David is saying when you're in trouble you need to turn to God when you're in trouble you need to turn to God Um, I kind of grew up with this planted in me God helps those who help themselves And so I would say to you, the greatest way that you can help yourself is by asking for God's help, okay? That's the greatest way that you can help yourself, is by turning to God. Uh, Before you knew God, you turned to somebody, or you turned to some 
thing, whatever those things may be. For David as a king, certainly he had the option to uh, look to his army, as many uh, kings would, as many general, generals would. They would look to the number of horses. They would look to the number of chariots. Later on in this psalm, you know, he, he defies that tendency to look to the possessions as, a, as, as kind of a, a gauge as to whether or not something would be successful. He says, you know, we're not going to look to our horses. We're not going to look to our chariots. We're not going to number our soldiers because we know ultimately our help comes from God. A king could look to his army. A king could look to his counselors. A king could look to his loot or his bank account. Uh, maybe for you, at one point in time, before you were Christian, you looked to your personality. You looked to your charisma. Uh, you looked to your looks. You know, maybe you've been able to get by because of the looks that God has graced you with. Um, you've looked to your possible, uh, possibly your experience. Uh, maybe you've looked to your financial resources. Maybe for you, when you were in that moment, you turned to some sin or some vice there were things that you looked to when you were in need of help, but all of that as a believer has gone away, and now you look to God. When you're in the midst of the storm, when things are difficult, let me tell you something. I'm not speaking this as a prophetic absolute word over your life, but I can tell you because I've lived long enough that you're going to experience storms this year, okay? Storms are coming. I don't know what those storms are going to be like. I don't know how long they're going to last, I don't know how difficult they're going to be, but if you've lived for any length of time, you know that there, there's, there's never been a year in your life where you've not had some type of storm. And you know, sometimes there are reasons for storms, but sometimes God brings storms. It's not that he always takes us around. Um, it's not that he always moves them out of the way. Sometimes God directs us straight into the storm. And I can tell you when God does that, He is always doing that, number one, so that you will find, you will learn to find your help in Him. God wants to help you. The invisible God, this blows me away, and I know like this is super rhetorical, like this is so obvious, but it's so sublime and it's so amazing that for me, it's still really hard to get my mind around. The invisible God wants to reveal himself visibly in your life. I think that's amazing. This, this God that transcends everything, uh, holy and sitting on his throne, sees every single circumstance in your life. You know, there's hundreds of people here tonight. And, you know, we can get lost in the numbers and we can begin to think, you know, that God sees on a macro level, but not a micro level. And the truth is this, the omniscient God, he knows all things, is fully acquainted with every single detail in your life. And in a sense, I don't mean to put words in his mouth, but in a sense, he is on the edge of his seat on his throne waiting for you, waiting for you to ask for help. So Christian, tonight, are you predisposed? Is your natural response when you're in the midst of the storm to go to God? Do you go to God? Or are you still relying on those temporary crutches that you have uh, leaned on in this world that you know do not have the strength to uphold you and do not have the strength to bring you through? May you have the blessing. May you have the blessing of God's help in your life. And may you be wise enough this year when you're in that moment of trouble or in that moment of need to turn your heart to him and to ask him for help. This is the promise of the Bible, by the way. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Just an amazing chapter. And it says this, For we do not have a high priest. We're, we're talking about Jesus. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore, because of that, because he's become so relevant, because he's lived the life, because he's been touched with temptation, like we've been touched with temptation, but he navigated it perfectly, but because he can sympathize. The Bible says this, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help, to help in time of need. Number one, May the blessing of God's help be with you. Number two, 
may you have the blessing of God's defense. Oh my gosh, did I put like a third of you to sleep already? You're like, oh, is that my cue? Okay, let's try it again. May you have the blessing of God's defense. Okay, so look, at as we go through this tonight, um, there should be like a crescendo. We're working our way up. We're, we're, we're working our way up. We're not working our way down. Uh, kind of like in worship, when, when Pastor Tony or Melena leads us, uh, we don't want to like start off up here and then by the fourth worship song, we're like down here in the valley somewhere. We're, we're just all sung out. And I've been, I've been standing for so long, Pastor, 25 minutes. Can't we just sit down? No, the answer is no, you can't. Um, and we're working to a crescendo, right? We're building up. Uh, so that's how it's going to roll. Don't, don't make me say it again. May you have the blessing of God's defense. He says this at the, um, sec- in the second part of verse 1. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. So in other words, may you be defended by the name of God. Um, God, is often called, God is often called the name or Hashem in Hebrew. Um, and you have to remember sometimes for, for us Gentiles... Uh, we don't really realize how, how seriously the Jews took the name of God. Uh, when I say the name of God, of course, I'm talking about in the Old Testament where the word Lord is in all capital letters. And that, of course, refers to the uh, name of God, which we think, no one really knows how to pronounce it, but we think it's something like Yahweh or in the Greek, Jehovah. Um, if you're a Jew, you're never going to say Jehovah, um, and you, you, you probably aren't going to pronounce the name of God out loud, although um, there was really no, there's no prohibition in the Old Testament for that, and there's no prohibition in the Mishnah, um, but they would call him, they would call him the name. They wouldn't speak the name because they had such a great reverence for it, but they would call God the name. And um, oftentimes when the scribes, you know, they were uh, taking the scriptures and, and they were uh, transmitting them onto another scroll. When they would get to the name of God, they would take a ritual mikvah bath. They would put on new clothes. They would get uh, a new quill and new ink. And then they, would, then they would write the name. That's how much they respected the word of God or the name of God. The name of God was never erased. So if they made a mistake, they didn't get the white out and blot the name of God out, that would have been disrespectful. Um, For them, in the Jewish culture, I know that sometimes when we give names to our kids, uh, we name them after movie stars, or we name them after Uncle What's-His-Face, or there's a lot of meaning for the Jews when they were naming their kids. It was almost like prophetically they were speaking over their life what their child was going to be. Um, So a name conveys nature, essence. It conveys history and reputation. So everything has a name, but there's no greater name than the name, all right? Everything has a name, but there's no name higher than his name. And this is what Uh, David is doing, David is invoking the name of God as the protection over the people of Israel. In other words, uh, the name of God operates in a sense like a shield. When I was in fourth grade, uh, there were people that were bullying me, and I'm really still hurt by it. No, I'm just kidding. Someone hold me. No. I got over it last year. But I had a friend who was in fifth grade, and his name was Steve, and Steve was tough, you know. Like, back then, uh, Steve's probably, like, bald and fat now, but back then, Steve was, Steve was tough. And um, so these people, when they would bully me, um, invariably what would happen is someone would come along and say, hey, man, don't mess with him because he's Steve's friend. And when the name of Steve was invoked, <laughs> everybody fled right? His name was like a shield, and God's name is like a shield over your life. May the name of God be as a shield over you this year. May the name of God be a defense over you. The name of the God of Jacob, right? How did Jacob experience God? God to him was the covenant-keeping God. God to him was the God of blessing, 
God was the God who appeared to him at Bethel and revealed himself to Jacob. He was a God of promise. Um, as Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord, with God himself, he received a blessing. He received a new name. May that God be the God this year that defends you. Guard yourself from the temptation of defending yourself, okay? Guard yourself from the temptation of defending yourself. It may be this year that there may, peop- may, there may be people who are in opposition to you and uh, call you into question. And as you know, you've done everything right in the eyes of God. Look to God as your defense because there's no stronger defense than the name of God. May you have this year the blessing of God's strength. Mm. That was really bad. I'm going to give you guys a pass on that, okay? But next time, don't let me down. So, um, may you receive this blessing, the blessing of God's strength. Uh, He says in verse 2, may he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. So, of course, the sanctuary represented uh, the presence of God because that's where the presence of God dwelt, the sanctuary being the tabernacle, the holy place and the most holy place. And Zion, of course, was the mountain where the tabernacle was was placed. It was the same mountain that Abraham offered Isaac to the Lord on. The same mountain where David purchased the threshing floor of Aruna and ultimately placed the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, The same mountain that when the Jews returned, Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple, the second temple, which was ultimately modified by Herod. The same mountain where the Temple Mount stands right now and ultimately the third temple is going to be built. But for the Jew, um, the sanctuary and Zion represented the presence of God. And your strength comes from God's presence in your life. You don't have to make a pilgrimage. Look, I, I pray that all of you go with me to Israel. But you don't have to make a pilgrimage to find the presence of God. If you're a child of God, remember that when Christ hung on the cross, the veil was torn in two from top to bottom, and that physical temple was replaced by your mortal body. And now as a believer, you house the presence of, the God, the presence of God uh, in the third person of the triune Godhead. In other words, listen, God dwells within you, and your strength is found when you have communion with the Father through the Son. This is the source of your strength. May you remember that this year. Uh, may you pursue that this year. May you be committed and disciplined this year to have those times daily, I think, and then, of course, throughout the day where you're feeding upon God and His faithfulness, intimately connecting with Him in prayer and the study of His Word. May you find strength in the secret place. Jesus talked about it. That secret place where the presence of God dwells and you discover him. May you find your strength there. And then may you find your strength among the people of God as we are worshiping God together. The fourth blessing. May, here we go. The fourth. Let me slow down. The fourth blessing. Okay. May you have the blessing of God's remembrance in your life. All right, verse 3, that's way better. Verse 3, may he remember all your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifice, Selah. So the fourth blessing tonight is this, may you have the blessing of God's remembrance. Um, And by that I mean this, and this is an amazing thing to consider, God remembers every good thing that you have done in the name of Jesus. God remembers every good thing that you have done in the name of Jesus. First of all, can I just say this? It's amazing that God would even see it. It's amazing that God would even be pleased by it. It's amazing that God would be, uh, that it would be acceptable to him that you could actually do something and God could say, yeah, I like that. That's good. That blesses me. That pleases me. Uh, The only reason that that is possible is because those things that you do by faith in the name of Jesus have been sprinkled by his blood. They've been sprinkled by his blood 
and they've been made acceptable to the Father because the sacrifice of Christ was made. May God remember. You know, God sees every single thing. You know, you may look back on this here, and you know, you've served, you've poured your heart out, and uh, there's just not a lot of thankful people. You're a mom. I was uh, just thinking about this yesterday. You know, my wife works tirelessly, and the house is constantly clean uh, because, you know, it's just the way she rolls. Uh, but she works hard to make that happen. And I was just thinking about it, so thankful that my wife worked so hard to bless her family, to take care of her kids, um, to give me the opportunity to be freed up to serve God in the capacity that I do. And you know, you know how it goes sometimes as a mom, sometimes as a mom, it feels as you're, as you're rolling out another load of laundry, as you're making another bed, um, as you're preparing another meal, and everybody just gets used to it, right? Everybody, of course, mom does that because she's supposed to. It's her job, you know? And sometimes as a mom, you're like, what the heck is this all about? Like, I'm working my fingers to the bone. Isn't anybody thankful? Doesn't anybody see? Oh, let me tell you something. God sees. God sees what you do. You know, we have this idea that uh, the most rewarded people in heaven are going to be pastors and evangelists. And, and I just think we're all going to be shocked. I think we're all going to be shocked. Where's, where's Derek? Oh, dude, he's in the back. Like, he's, he's way in the back. And did you see his crown? It's really small. It's really small. And then there's going to be all these moms in the front, you know. And, and, and God's going to say, I saw it. I saw that. I saw that. All these wives in the front, you know, um, and, and God is going to say, I saw that. And you know what? You did that for me. You did that for me. You did that when no one else acknowledged you. Um, you did that when no one else patted you on the back. You did that um, when it was hard, when it was difficult. I think the most meaningful service to God is in those moments where it is hard, where it's difficult, where it costs you something. And even if no one else sees, I want to tell you today that the eyes of God are on your life. And may he bring to remembrance. He doesn't miss a single thing. And you know, as you serve him, he is going to, he is going to honor you with that sacrifice that you have made for him. Colossians 3.17 says this, Whatever you do in word and in deed, do all to the glory of God. Um, and that means more than just uh, doing it in a way so that everybody else sees. It means doing it in a way ultimately where the most important thing to you is this that God sees. You know, I, I get concerned about that sometimes. Even, look, for me as a pastor, I do a whole bunch of stuff in front of a whole bunch of people. Um, but you know, that's not what it necessarily means to glorify God. It means to have a heart so that when you're doing something, it doesn't matter if no one else sees. What matters is that God sees, and it is pleasing to him. Hebrews 13, 16 says this, Do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. You know, you're at that intersection, and God stirs your heart, and it's your last $5. Um, and... You know, you're not sure necessarily how this guy or gal is going to use it. All you know is this, that God has touched your heart and stirred your heart. And so what, you, what do you do? You roll down the window and you hand that money and you say, you know, God bless you. I'm praying for you. And, and I, I pray that God uses this in your life. God sees those things and God is well pleased with them. The fifth blessing for you tonight is this. May you have the blessing of God's fulfilled purpose for your life. The Bible says in verse 4, May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice, this is the response to this blessing, we will, re will rejoice in your salvation and in the name of our God we will set up our, our banners. So the fifth blessing tonight is this, that um, God would bless you this year with, with a sense of fulfillment in the purpose of your life. As you're searching for purpose, may this year be a year 
where you are experiencing the fulfillment of purpose in your life. Um, and that happens, listen now, that happens when his desires become your desires, okay? When his desires become your desires. When I say purpose, I don't mean your will be done on earth, okay, as you hope it will be in heaven as well. I mean, you've come to a place in your life where this is what you want. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. By that I mean this, that as a Christian, you have aligned yourself with God's desires. You have uh, changed your life so that you're living in congruency, you're congruent with the word of God. Like, you're not saying, hey God, these are my demands, and you got uh, 24 hours to meet them. You got another, another year of singleness? I don't think so. And if you don't come through, then you know what? I'm out of here. Have you ever threatened God before? <laughs> yes, you have. <laughs> have you ever given God an ultimatum? Like, let me tell you how this is going to work, God. <laughs> do, do you know he, he's got to laugh? He just laughs in heaven. He's like, oh, I love you, you little. <laughs> there are like five words that crossed my mind right there. None of them was appropriate. So <laughs> not a word I want to put in God's mouth, but. But, you know, he just, you know, he smiles. He's so, Tony was praying before the service, you know, just that God is so long-suffering with us. He's so long-suffering. Like, really, do not take yourself too seriously. Um, and I, 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 this is true for, for me and for those in leadership um, because no one is all that. No one is all that. I mean, when we really compare ourselves to God, uh, we are all pretty much standing on the same ground. And he is God, and, and we are not. He's an amazing God. He's high and lifted up. He's exalted. And this is our desire. Our desires should be conformed to his desires. And this is when you experience fulfillment um, as you're seeking for purpose in your life. When you lose your life for his sake and for the gospel's sake, this is the crazy thing. It sounds so counterintuitive. That's when you find it. You, you don't find yourself, you don't find purpose in your life when you find yourself. You find purpose in your life when you, when you die to yourself and you begin to live for God. When you choose to live dead. And it sounds like an oxymoron, but that's, you're like, yeah, you sound like a moron, all right. That's, I'm just saying to you tonight, when you, when you die to your will and you live for the will of God, that's when you discover real purpose. Have you, have you asked? Have you asked? Like you're rolling through life and like you're clicking at a killer rate and you're moving from 2016 to 2017. Have you ever even stopped to ask, hey, um, God, by the, will, by the way, is this, is this your will for my life? Is this really what you want? Is this job where uh, you, you really have me and you really want me? Is this the career that you've determined for my life? Is this person that I'm dating really from you, or is this person really not from you? I know that they're not saved, but you know, I know you can use me in their, look, stop, that's not God's will, okay? I just, I set you up intentionally, because if you're there tonight, there's no such thing as evangelistic dating, um, but, but pastor, you don't understand, God's placed me in their life, just shut up and stop arguing with me, okay? Do not be unequally yoked with a non-believer. But, but have you taken the time to, to even stop and ask God? God, sort it out. Maybe you are on track. You know, there's nothing better than hearing a confirming word from God saying this. You know what? Keep going. You know, keep doing what you're doing. You're exactly where I want you. Because there's nothing worse than to be unsure. When someone comes along and says, hey, is this really the will of God? Well, you know, I, I don't know. I've never asked. I've never prayed. You will never be in a place where you experience the fulfillment of purpose in your life if you've not first asked God whether what you're doing is his will or not his will. And so I want to encourage you to do that. I love Psalm 37, verse 4. It says this, delight yourself also in the Lord. And he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. So as you delight yourself in God, this is what he does. Your desires are conformed to his desires. 
And then this is how he responds. He gives you the desires of your heart. You know, I think sometimes the difficulty is this. We're afraid to ask because we're afraid of the answer. Well, you know, what if? What if he says, hey, you know, this was a great season in your life, and I know. Uh, you went to school for this, and uh, you, you know, you got a lot of upward mobility, but I got a different thing for you. And, you know, frankly, you're just scared. You're, you're just afraid of that. Uh, Jerry, Pastor Jerry today, he was talking about missions. It was so funny um, because he was talking about going on a missions trip, and then, you know, we had Brittany that we were praying for. She's in Thailand, and um, he said, you know, come to the missions conference, and who knows, maybe God's going to stir your heart, and you're going to be a missionary to something like this in the Philippines or in Thailand. And I was just watching everybody's response. And honestly, the thought in my mind was this. If she was a missionary in Hawaii, <laughs> this was what I was thinking. Because there wasn't a lot of response. People were like, amen. I want that for my life. Here, here I come to the Philippines. But if she was a missionary to Hawaii, uh, by the way, a couple years ago, we were talking about taking a missions trip to Hawaii and we got more response for that missions trip than I have ever seen in my life. I had people knocking down my door. Pastor, God has called me. He spoke to me when you said the word Hawaii. My name was connected to it. I'm like, whatever, you know. Um, but you know how we are. We're afraid. We're afraid to ask because we don't know what God is going to say. And what if, think about this, what if he says something we don't like? So then are you saying to me you would rather live, uh, you would rather live your life not fulfilling God's will because you're afraid that he might say to you what you're doing is not his will? You would rather live in that condition? This is what it comes down to. It comes down to you and me trusting God. And God's plan for your life is better than yours. May you have that blessing on your life this year. Sixth and final blessing tonight is this. May you have the blessing of answered prayer in your life this year. I mean, I, this, and this is just so good. May the Lord, verse 5b, may the Lord fulfill some of your petitions. There we go. That's right. Because that's a good word, right? Three little letters all tied together. Uh, it, it's like the word but, you know, just they're, they're great. Some of the greatest words in the Bible are the smallest words. And this is one of those words that is just a great word. It doesn't say may the Lord fulfill uh, a percentage of or some of your petitions. Um, you're, you're lucky to get away with just a few. This is the, this is the blessing. May he fulfill all of them. Every single one. You know, as you've determined in your heart to seek God, is this your desire for 2017? Like, what is your plan? Are you just rolling in and you're just status quo? Are you a status quo person? I hope you're not. I hope that there's a fire in your heart to pursue God like you've never pursued Him before and to draw near to Him and to connect intimately with Him, to have the spiritual gifts that God has given to you stirred up for the purposes of, of the advancement of his kingdom. When you're in that place, when you're in that place, then, and you're walking in God's will, it's easy to speak this blessing over your life. Every prayer that you pray, as you are looking to the word of God and, and the scriptures guiding you, and you desire what God desires for your life, every prayer that you pray, may God answer them. May God answer them abundantly. May God make it so absolutely evident in your life that he is working, that it causes you to have a renewed sense of awe in him. Do you have an awe of God in your life? Are you in, are you in awe? Are you overwhelmed? Are you amazed? Um, are you brought to times of speechlessness because what God is doing is so profound and so rich uh, and so supernatural, so deep in your life? that you just don't even have words. Uh, you can't put words together to express the awe and the wonder that you have for God. Because listen, I think this is something that's, that shouldn't be waning in our Christian life. This is something that should be growing in our Christian life. 
Our expression of worship to Him just in song shouldn't be something that gets shallower or leaner. It should be something that gets richer and deeper because this is what David says, now I know. Look, I've lived it. I've experienced it. Day by day, I see the mighty hand of God answering prayer in my life. I see it with my eyes. I can touch it with my hands beyond a shadow of a doubt. And that leads me to a place as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ where worship becomes richer and fuller, not, not weaker and shallower. May you this year, and I, I really want to strongly encourage you, journal it, journal it. When you're asking God for something, remember, ask persistently. God wants you to annoy him. God wants some of you are really good at that, by the way. <laughs> like, just as you are with people, do that to God, okay? Like, he wants you to be persistent. And Jesus said, men ought always to pray and never lose heart. And then he gives a parable of the, of the widow who was in need. And she, like, was all over the unjust judge. And the guy was finally like, this guy wasn't even just. He's finally like, okay, look, if I do this, will you just shut up? And Jesus wasn't saying that God is like that to us. What he's saying is this, because she was persistent, she got what she asked for. And you need to be that persistent with God this year. You know, maybe he's not been coming through in the timing that you want. His timing is perfect. God is rarely early, but he's never late. May you have not only persistence in prayer, may you have endurance in prayer. May you endure as you're praying for the salvation of the souls of people around you. And may you experience the fruit of answered prayer in your life. And when you do, give the glory to God. You know, last... Uh, Last month, sometime, we were talking about this, and then we just went around. We're not going to do it tonight, but we went around, and I just said, hey, listen, how many people have had answered prayer? And speak it out. How many of you guys were here for that? Do you remember that? Okay. It was pretty encouraging, wasn't it? Oh, well, sorry. <laughs> guess I was the only one that was encouraged. <laughs> but look, I saw some of your faces, and... Um, and I could see it, you know, like the wheels were turning, and it was like something like this as I was reading your face and putting words in your mouth. This is how it went. Um, it went something like this. If God can do that in their life, God can do it in my life, right? If God can do that in their, you guys, this is what I'm saying. You need to share when God answers prayer. You need to share it. You need to speak it. You need to encourage people. You need to let people know. You never know. You might be saying to somebody, hey, you know, I've been praying for this particular thing and God did a work and that person may just be on the precipice or the edge of giving up. And that, that statement that you make, the glory that you give to God in that moment may be the very thing that reels them back from the edge and gets them redirected and focused on the Lord. And so may God answer prayer in your life, not just for you, but may God answer prayer in your life for those around you who need to be encouraged. God wants to bless you for sure, but God doesn't want to just bless you for you. We're so narcissistic as Christians, right? A lot of times, it's all about me all the time. 365 days, 8,700 hours, 535,000 minutes, 31.5 million seconds of me. Okay, I pray your year is not like that. I pray that the 31.5 million seconds that God gives you this year are not all about you. And I pray that as you receive answered prayer in your life, that God uses the blessing of answered prayer to bless other people. May these blessings be over you this year. May they strengthen you. May they encourage you. May they be used as uh, markers to guide you and to direct you. In the midst of difficulty, in the midst of storms and challenges, may they be the things that keep you on course and focused on God. May God give you clarity when the fog of confusion descends. And may the truth of God's word blow that fog away so you have clear direction in what God has called you to do. May he speak into your life. And may he refine those things that you're doing so that you're able to say to him, because that's really what matters most. God, I know that I'm right where you want me. And because I know that, I'm going to dig in with all of my heart so that you get the glory for all the great things that you're doing. In Jesus' name.
Father, thank you tonight for your word. We pray, please, that you, that the seed of your word would, as we've received it, as we have said, I receive that in Jesus' name. I pray as we have received with meekness your implanted word, that tonight you would cause your word to to bear fruit in our lives, that this seed, um, God, even though we may not see it now, it's germinating under the soil um, and in the darkness of the inward parts of our life. But God, we pray that as this seed germinates, that it would spring forth, that it would bring forth fruit. Jesus, you said that this was your will, that we would bear much fruit so that the Father might be glorified. And God, tonight as we align ourselves with your word and your desires, may these things that you've spoken to us bring forth in abundance. God, I, I'm praying not just for 30, 60, or 90. I'm praying for a, a hundredfold plus. Would you cause us to be that fruitful this year. May you be the center of our lives. Tonight as we're praying, I just want to ask you this evening, do you have a relationship with God? Do you know God? Have you believed in Jesus Christ? Let me tell you what it means to be a Christian. A a Christian is somebody who in the midst of trouble, the trouble of sin, in the midst of brokenness, as God has revealed to them sin and offenses and transgressions that have been committed against him. The Christian is a person who has cried out to God for salvation and trusted in Jesus Christ. The Christian is not the one who's pulled themselves up by their moral bootstraps. The Christian is not the one who who is uh, getting a form of religion and becoming familiar with religious things. That's not what it means to be a Christian. A Christian is someone who's understood that they've sinned against God and deserve an eternity of punishment, but that God in His grace and mercy sent His Son, born of a virgin, who lived a perfect life, was delivered to a cross, hung there in our place, dead and buried, and rose again the third day. The Christian is the one who has turned to Jesus for help. Tonight, if you've never turned to Jesus for help, would you tonight, would you do that? You know, maybe you've been leaning on things and looking to to people or um, to your own abilities, or maybe you're the person that's been turning to sin and vice and addictions. And you know the truth is this, you're broken. You know you need more than those things can offer you. And, and tonight, the one who is able to help and deliver, his name is Jesus. Will you believe in him tonight? Tonight, you can receive him into your life, confessing him as Lord and Savior, trusting in his sacrifice for you and his resurrection. And this is the promise of God. This is what God says. There will be answered prayer immediately from heaven. As you make this your prayer to God and your confession to him, he will hear immediately in that moment. And you will be saved you will be delivered, you will be forgiven, you'll be given the gift of everlasting life. This is the promise of the Bible. And so tonight, if this is you, and and here you are, brought here by God, you need Jesus in your life, would you raise your hand tonight? Just acknowledge by the raising of your hand, you're simply saying this, Derek, that's me, God bless you, over here, I see your hand. God bless the both of you. Thank you so much. God bless you here in the center. I see your hand here in the center as well. God is so good. He's here to help. He's ready to help. I mean that with all of my heart. This is the promise of Scripture. He is is willing and able tonight to bring to you and to give to you every single thing that you need. You don't have to fix your life first. You can come to him just as you are, in faith, and he will not turn you away. Anybody else? Just stretch your hand up high. Let me see who you are this evening.
Tonight, if you're a Christian and as you look back on this year, you know you've um, not only not been growing in your relationship with God, you've been sliding backwards. Things have gotten worse instead of better. And maybe you've been turning back to the things of this world. And as you start this year, you know that you need a marker in your life. You need to rededicate. You need to recommit your life to Jesus. I talk about God fulfilling the desires of your heart. And the truth is this, your heart has been filled with your own desires, your own will. And tonight that needs to change. And you, please, do not go another day. Do not go another year living out your will for your life. If you're prodigal tonight, you need to come home to your Heavenly Father. You need to get yourself headed in the right direction as we start this new year. I want to pray for you too. Would you raise your hand tonight? God bless you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Anybody else? See your hand here in the center. It's great. God is so good. Right here. Thank you in the center for raising your hand. See your hand over here on my left. Awesome. It's good. He's present with us. Father, thank you so much for each of these this night and um, just how deep the Father's love for us. It's amazing. It's so good. And God, we want to meditate on that. Bless these lives now and grant them strength and courage tonight to take this step of faith and to believe with all of their hearts and God, to, to head in the right direction and looking to Jesus for help is the right direction, God. Confirm that within them tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, for all of you who have raised your hands, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer tonight, okay? So if you are receiving Christ for the first time or maybe you're, you're recommitting your life to Him, just a very simple prayer of um, the confession of sin and trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus, when He called His disciples, He called them publicly, and tonight I'm going to give you the opportunity to really, to really make a stand for Jesus. And He made a stand for you when He went to the cross. You can do this for Him tonight. I'm going to lead you in this prayer, and I'm going to ask all of you who raised your hands, as Pastor Tony is leading us in worship, just to stand up right now. Come on down to the front of the chapel tonight. I'm right here with you. All who are broken, all who are weak, all sinners condemned unclean. If you're tired and you're thirsty, he welcomes you home. Come as you are to the Lord. Don't wait for tomorrow. Tomorrow may not come. Run to the arms of the Father. His rescue is enough. Lord, we will run to you with open arms with sin laid down with lifted hearts we give up everything and count it all as loss but we surrender at the foot of the cross is there anybody else tonight i know there's a, a few more of you that raised your hands and and you know you you might be processing it like this well you know i don't really i don't really have to i don't really have to go up i can pray right here and god will hear me i'm not denying that that's not true that is true god will hear you right where you're seated but how much better how much better for you to stand tonight and to come forward to make a, a clean break with the past and to start fresh in your relationship with God. How much better for you to, to boldly proclaim, to allow this to be a beginning for you where you live out fully your faith in Jesus Christ. This is why this is so important. And so I'm going to lead these in prayer tonight, but if there's anybody else this evening, you know, you're in your seat and, and maybe that's your process tonight, I just really want to encourage you. This is the safest place for you to make a, an expression of faith in Jesus Christ. This is a place where you're not going to be judged. People aren't going to be looking at you and wondering about your life. People are genuinely excited for what God is doing 
in you tonight. And so if there's anybody else, I know, I know there's somebody else. Like I, I shared that and, and I know that's for someone tonight. And so for whoever that's for, I'm just going to ask you to stand up and come forward tonight and um, take this step of faith and let God bless you. so excited for what God is doing in your life. It's amazing. And tonight I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. It's a prayer of confession and faith. And this prayer uh, is not to me, it's not to this church, it's to God. And as you pray, God has promised to hear, and He's going to answer in your life. So let's bow our heads together and I'd like you to repeat out loud this prayer after me. Dear God, Thank you for loving me. Thank you that you care about me. Thank you that I can ask you for help. Thank you for Jesus. Tonight I believe in him. That he died for me. And that he rose again. And that through him, I am forgiven I'm your child, I'm heaven bound, I'm spirit filled. Thank you God for all that you've done. In Jesus name I pray, amen, amen, awesome, awesome, so good. Stretch your legs, uh, but don't leave because listen, we're ending with a crescendo, right? Everything goes up in the worship service. Uh, so that means you're going to worship with all your heart. God bless you guys. Happy New Year. Oh, my God.